This is the Doc Nation Podcast. We are a movement founded by doctors for doctors dedicated to empowering medical professionals to reclaim control over healthcare decisions and advocating for their fair share of the industry's resources. Please note the views expressed are those of Doc Nation and not necessarily those of our guests or reference health centers. John, it's great to be with you again, talking about doctor's voice and what's been happening in multiple decades leading up to this point. And I'd love to hear uh, some of the recent happenings as you were sharing with us recently about what's going on in Delaware. Uh, We have lots to get into as far as the state of the union with doctors and what's been happening in healthcare. Um, But tell us about what are some of the current things that are going on within the landscape as it relates to indu- or the, the labor relations. Hey, I just want I, I to, I'm going to interrupt here just, just yeah. briefly. Um, I don't mean this to be flatterous, flattery. How do you say that? Flatterous? In, in, that, in, that, in that text right there. I don't mean flattery by what I'm about to say, okay? But John August is, is been around and done some really, really big things for a very, very long time. Um, Uh, in the union world and doc nation is just grateful to have him here to be a very, uh, to be very, very open. Um, he's here volunteering his knowledge and really what it is, is, uh, passing the torch of knowledge and leadership. Um, he saw doc nation and says, Hey, they're doing something significant. Uh, but I think I can provide some leadership. And we reached out to John and, and started picking his brain. And the more we picked his brain, the more we like, we need this guy on our team. And so we invited him out to uh, where, where we go, guys. We went to Las Vegas and we were on stage with him. And uh, really, John, I just always think about uh, uh, what Doc Nation exists to do. We do two things. We're a service oriented company uh, where it's like a professional athlete has an agent. Doc Nation is the agent for physicians and people are signing up. And we're getting huge individual wins, right? That's on the individual basis. Um, but what we have you here for, John, and what we have you really uh, as a part of Doc Nation to do is to help lead the other part of what Doc Nation exists to do, and that's to create a union for doctors. Uh, medic, uh, medicine is in shambles right now. Fifty uh, percent plus of our um, clients are telling their children, "Do not go into medicine." That number has probably gone up significantly. Um, and so I just wanted to say, John, thank you. We're, we're humbled that you're here. We're humbled that, uh, uh, you've provided leadership and support to us. Um, the, the truth is doc nation is going to need to be like a groundswell company in terms of whether we go 501 C three with the union side of it, it's going to need to be, uh, uh, it's going to kind of need to catch fire and people are going to need to join and support and help doc nation. Isn't building a union for doc nation. It's not going to do anything for Doc Nation, right? It really isn't. It, it's the representation. We want to be the leaders that represent uh, the spark to create this union. So uh, without further ado, I just want to say thank you for, for being a part of uh, a number of things that we've, we've invited you to. Thank you, Reed. Um, and uh, well, everything that you just said is a fantastic foundation for, I think, uh, the, our purpose today and, and going forward. And, and that is to actually uh, put some framing around the idea of the relationship of individual physicians' needs, as well as the need for some collective voice around needs. Uh, that's the reality. Uh, and physicians historically have been independent uh, practitioners. Uh, sometimes on their own, sometimes in small groups, sometimes in large groups. But the the trend across the country is that the the um, uh, individual practitioner, the small group, even the large group, is receding. And uh, the New England Journal of Medicine tells us that about seventy two percent of doctors today are employed, and w- the, the one um, data point that I want to make about that, and then we can have some conversation, is that uh, I have never seen 
Uh, and I'm not sure that history has ever seen in the United States a larger group of people in a labor market, specifically physicians, somewhere between 600,000 and a million physicians, yep. who've all lost their collective power at the same time. Mm -hmm. Unprecedented. You're, you're talking about in comparison to any other industry or class of worker? Never seen anything like it. This is the largest class of worker that has no voice. Well, I, here's what, I want to be very specific about what I mean, and that is that over the course of, you know, say the last hundred years, uh, there was a time when workers in the United States had no voice at all. Uh, they struggled for that voice in the late 19th century, and by the 1930s, uh, you began to see tens of millions of people who were previously voiceless mm -hmm. uh, build a union. So. Um, I would say since that time, since that time, I have never seen a larger group of people without a voice, uh, or, or I should say, maybe had a voice in a different context, mm -hmm. in their own individual practices, to now going to be employed and being employed in an environment where the industry has consolidated in the nonprofit for-profit and private equity world. Uh, so the gulf between lack of voice and concentration of power in the industry, I would say is unprecedented. I think back to 15 years ago, and when we started helping doctors and their families, this was not on our radar. We had no idea that doctors were in a downward sloping, like approaching the cliff situation. At that point in time was like, we were pretty much clueless to mm -hmm. the challenge and the, the obstacles and the burden and the, the slipping away, like had no idea. And now it's at the point where Doctors have no ability to to have a centralized voice or they don't have a they can't agree on anything. It's like the lack of a, ability to agree on just some of the core basic pieces of this has caused everybody to become so isolated, isolated, <clears throat> isolated yep. that they're totally on their own. That's right. And you know, I, I think of mindsets, I think of mindsets and. You know, the more that we see uh, the cut in physician salary year after year after year, the more it, it is permeates a scarcity mindset uh, amongst the physicians to to just take care of themselves, focus on me, focus on me and my individual contract with the with the with the hospital. And I think it's kind of scared doctors away from coming together in any fashion because they don't want to lose the little bit that they currently have. And so my concern, my overall concern, you know, after going to, to Florida and talking to a group of doctors is how much worse does it have to get for people for this not to just catch fire easily? Like th this, this seems like a no brainer to us. And maybe it's because we're talking to doctors. It's like a conveyor belt of doctors every day. Justin and I sit here, we talk to new doctors every day about the issues they have and they sign up in some form or fashion with us. And uh, I'm just concerned that people, that our heads are in the sand too much, to be honest with you. I, I think things are slowly slipping away. And I, I, is it too far gone? Is there, is the, has the power shifted too far? Uh, the physicians are just, there's no chance. Well, when I, was, when I was mentioning the 15 years ago piece of it, Reed, think about how the idea that we would be talking about supporting unions yeah, and how far of a swing that is for us. I mean, that's we typically come from a conservative background, yep. very much uh, 
capitalistic in nature, want to see growth, love innovation, love starting companies. Our favorite thing to do is start companies, help people start companies, help them become entrepreneurs, help them be independent as much as possible. And that love that we have, that passion we have to do that is for people that it's, it's locking arms with those that want to have as much say and control over each day and everything that they're doing. And now we're talking about 15 years later after entering into this industry, going into how much things have changed, where to John's point with, was it 77% or 75% or 72%? 72% of doctors are employed. Are employed. <laughs> like that's such a huge change that has occurred. And we wanted to help individuals. We wanted to help businesses. We started Doc Nation to go above and beyond what a lot of the limitations we had before in some of the previous ventures we've worked on for doctors. And so this is the pathway where we have less strings attached, less shackles, less red tape to be able to try to get doctors to come together. And it's now in a place, putting us in a place where we're talking about the union side of things, which is not really a thing that we would normally be doing. And that's what it's come down to. We're at a point now where we're needing to take much different types of steps and moves and measures to see actual reform take place. And just reminds me of what you were saying earlier, John, previous conversation about the big things happening in Delaware. There are things that are, are going on. Big things have to happen to start to, to turn the, the tide. This ship of healthcare is huge. It takes a long time to change course and to move. And there are some things moving here and there, but this is, this is serious. This is major. I, and I don't want to sound hopeless, but we started by helping doctors start their own private practices. You know, we, we, mm -hmm. it's just going to take way too long that we're, it's, it's one by out. one. Yeah, yeah. One by one. And it's, it's going in the opposite direction. And so just being in it, being on the field, talking to doctors all day long, um, you just get the sense that there's there's a very, very small few that have a fight in them to do something about this. And that that's my only concern. It, it, I, I, I actually want to focus less on administration and less on government and less. I want to focus on the team that we should have uh, and build a team together, because if we have a collective voice, all the things that 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 every physician either doesn't know that they want and need um, or they do know they can have. Yeah, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to inject into the conversation also uh, is that, you know, the kinds of issues that you're talking about that that doctors face and uh, uh, whether they're individuals or, again, in group practices or even in large entities. Um, you know, there's a tendency in our country today for everything to sound super polarized, mm -hmm. which really, I think, causes just two things, anger and hopelessness. Yeah. You know, people say, well, corporate medicine is evil and for-profit medicine is evil. And, you know, I there's no doubt that there are people and players who maybe are. But the fact is, is that I think most people in healthcare are there for, you know, a general notion that they, they really want to help people. And I think it's important to keep grounded in that. That's number one. Number two, putting good and evil aside, is that there are certain realities going on that got to get dealt with. And what are they? I would say three major things. One is that, as you indicated earlier, doctor's compensation is on the chopping block. I hear from doctors all the time about how they went to work at an emergency room. They went to work uh, as a surgeon. They went to work as a pulmonologist. And then one day, somebody that they never heard of in the corporate office says, oh, we're going to change your contract. 
And people go, what do you mean you're going to change my contract? And they say, just watch. And we're only going to give you a certain amount of time to agree or not. And if you don't agree, we're going to implement it anyway. Now, I mean, like people would say, well, that sounds evil. Well, I would say what it is, is that there's a gigantic gap that's evolved now in medicine, whereby decisions are being made, you know, at a high level about cost and about compensation and everything related to it. And we have a big problem, which is that that's, there's nothing new about that in you know a capitalist society. People who run things make decisions. The problem is, is that when a worker, or in this case, a physician feels that they are just being treated completely unjustly, and it's demoralizing, that has an impact on them, and it has a tremendous impact on their ability to wake up every day and want to deliver the patient care that they know they're capable of. So that's one thing that's going on. Secondly, uh, what we see uh, is that the the reality of this threat to people's compensation and job security uh, exacerbates an already existing problem, which is the intervention, again, of outside parties making decisions about how care is delivered. Might be an insurance company. Again, it might be an administrator, so that uh, doctors are constantly being having their shoulder looked over about decisions that they historically are authorized and trained to make, and now they oftentimes are not able to do that uh, on their terms or in the time frame that they think is necessary. And then you add to that, you know, what is also happening, is, and you guys referred to that earlier, which is that people are not so sure that another generation is going to follow them into medicine. Right. So those three things are all related. Is it a matter of good and evil? I think we should stay away from that, and we should just look squarely in the eye of the lack of power that people have to be able to alter those realities. It's just business, frankly. But how how can you be in a business when you have no voice? It means you're not really in a business. You're you're just being told what to do, and mm-hmm. that's that's a, a problem that I think is affecting. I would say it's not an exaggeration to say a majority of doctors practicing in the country today. Yeah, you said something like uh, people, people in leadership make decisions or people in power make decisions, and and that's true. And we don't disagree with that. We're we're, we're capitalistic entrepreneurs, and I love that Justin brought that up. It's kind of a personal thing that we look at each other and we say, "I can't believe we're even pursuing this." And when people think about, you know, someone who's capitalistic in nature. It has a lot of negative connotations to it these days, uh, and 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 that's sad because all it is is that we're we're saying we're betting on ourselves and we're going to go work until uh, it works, and so there's a lot of risk in, in inherently in that. But going back to you say people in power make decisions, that's true, and that's administration. But if you look at at, at pro pro baseball, pro basketball, pro football. They have a union that balanced that power a little bit. And, and, and why is that, right? You know, the truth is, in Justin and my companies in the past, yes, we could we could let someone go and replace them. Um, but we don't have 20,000, 30,000 employees, right? Where Wherein if eight of them banded together, we could probably replace eight of them. You can't do that with 20, 30,000. I'm thinking about professional athletes and more than that. And if they all band together, uh, the stars of the show, right? Like, do you guys know who who's coaching in the Olympics? Who's the, who's the basketball coach for Team USA in the Olympics right now? John, do you know? Steve Kerr. Dang it. You know that because you know sports well. That's the only reason. He knows sports well. But who's the, who's the flag bearer? Coco Goff and LeBron James. Look at that. Who the players? People know the players, right? You go, you go get work done at the hospital. You know your doctor. You don't know the administrator. What I'm trying to say is it's different in medicine. It's different amongst physicians. There is a different level of knowledge and expertise that 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 most people do not have. Just like 
Most people cannot jump and shoot and run like LeBron James. There's power in that too. And so the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is so close. This could be so close to happening if the stars of the show would band together. It, it happened, and when it happened in Major League Baseball, it didn't take long. Once people got together, it didn't take a very long time. So I, I don't disagree with the owners of the baseball teams need to make decisions for for the organization because they're the ones paying the seven hundred million dollar contracts to the top players. Right. Where's that money? It's got to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there's a balance of power wherein the players can say, you know, I want to opt out of this contract and go somewhere else. And there's freedom to do that. Because you say, hey, if you don't like this new contract, doctor, uh, well, we're going to implement it anyway. And it's not so easy to just bounce around uh, for a physician as it is maybe a professional athlete. Well, I I don't want to disagree with you. So this is not a disagreement. But it, Let's it's disagree. Of, it's, <laughs> well, no, it, not at all. It's not a disagreement. But it's, uh, I think it's an interpretation uh, on the notion of leadership, decision making, and uh, the kind of capitalism that we all want. Um, you know, uh, there's an awful lot of data and an awful lot of books that have been written and an awful lot of uh, very important study that's been done and says that you are not going to have a successful company in today's world unless the company empowers the people who work there to be able to be a participant in the in the purpose and the direction of the company. Uh, those are the most successful companies in the world. Uh, Toyota, uh, Dan and Yogurt, um, Mercedes Benz. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, we have Patagonia. We have many, many examples of successful, 100% capitalist uh, owned and operated companies. But uh, when you demoralize your front line, I try to imagine winning the Super Bowl with a demoralized team. Impossible. Right. It doesn't matter how talented they are. If they're demoralized, they are not going to win. In fact, they might even work against you. That's right. And, um, so when it comes to doctors or mm -hmm. when it comes to the team that they work with, nurses, technicians, and others, if, if they are not empowered to have a voice, you are not going to have good patient care. And as a result, you're not going to have a good business because today's world of healthcare is very much related to a transparent, um, uh, data-driven set uh, of relationships between revenue and quality. And that's a lot of what's at the heart of what's going on, where people in C-suites see the numbers, they see the challenges, and what they do is instead of taking a chance on trying to step up and improve quality and improve the nature of the work, they try to make cuts as a way of taking yeah. a shortcut to be able to achieve success, and that does not work. And that is what is putting tremendous pressure on doctors today. Because the only thing a doctor thinks about is the highest quality of care for every single patient. That's all they think about. That's, that's right. what they're trained to do, and that's what they believe in. And they're in a situation where that is challenged every day. I think back to when Major League Baseball, uh, they, uh, they they held a strike. <clears throat> One of the things the players did, and it hurt them so bad, and I know this, because we, we we had an older player come to, to one of our dugouts and talk to us, but they would stop talking to the fans, stop signing autographs. They wouldn't even look at the fans. There was no interaction with the fans. Before they struck, they did a bunch of things to 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 to, to try to open the ears of the owners uh, before they had to strike. And why were they doing that? They were doing that because the fans pay for the tickets. And if the fans don't show and the fans don't like your team, maybe that gets the owners to start thinking, well, I think there's a different level of care from a professional athlete to a doctor in terms of, I don't see, I've never seen actually one time any of our clients or anybody that we worked with say, you know what, I'm just so upset with administration. I'm not going to give the this next patient the time they deserve. I've never seen that once. And so that's part of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always really hard on the physician because it's mm -hmm. the physician side of things. Like, let's just band together and do this. 
Um, but it's a little bit more difficult for physicians than it is professional athletes because they've 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 signed they've signed their their name on a dotted line to provide uh, 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 the best care possible. And it's different when you're playing a baseball game versus talking about someone's life or death situation. And so I do understand the difficulties there uh, uh, to say, hey, let's throw arms up and we're just not going to show up. We're not going to show up. I, I understand that. And let's add to what's always in the ringing of the ears, if you will, or the ringing of the brain of the physician. And that's their oath to do no harm. That's right. Which is, which, which is, uh, the other side of the same coin of wanting to give the best quality care all the time. Because if you can't give the best quality of care, you are doing harm. And they know both of those things to be just devastating yep. in terms of the antithesis of why they became doctors. John, talk to us about the things that doctors are unified around that they can't agree on. And then also let's talk about the things that they are having a hard time agreeing on, <clears throat> a hard time agreeing on, which has led to people being off in their own directions. Because I think to your point, Reed, the player focuses on their performance and their contribution to the team. They're not having to worry about what's going on personally with the fan in the stands. <clears throat> That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I was on a phone call last uh, Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday. And someone had heard of one of our uh, webinars or watched one of our webinars. And they're like, hey, dude, it's, it's a little easier for professional athletes to strike than it is for us to strike. I just want you to know that. And it really was humbling to me. It yeah. was humbling to me to say, OK, there is a there is a difference. And so that's why I bring it up I, I, I in, in this um, now podcast is because. I understand the challenges. I understand that there's that there's a significant difference, but I also understand the power in 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 a collective bargaining group at least to start having conversations because we're not even really there yet. Well, I I would argue it's not easy for anyone to strike, and I think you would agree with that um, because you know for for every uh, uh, ten million dollar player in the NFL or Major League Baseball. The majority are people who make somewhere between, you know, the minimum and maybe a little bit more than that. And there's a lot on the line, not the least of which is that their careers, especially in football and in other professional sports, are shorter and shorter because of injury and other things. So there's always risk, I would say, for physicians. Um, uh, that's a big issue, and and uh, and we should address that uh before I do, though, I, to answer your question, Justin, I think that I think that my experience is that doctors agree on a lot of things that need to change. They they want to have a direct voice in the mm -hmm. way care is delivered. They want to have a direct voice in the support team that they have because they know that they can't practice without nurses, without technicians, without laboratory, without all of those ancillary services, which are oftentimes short staffed or contracted out. God forbid. Um, so they're very concerned about those issues that, and are pretty unified around that. Uh, they're unified around wanting to have control over their uh, decision making about the patients. And they're very unified about wanting to have a voice over compensation. Not so much because they just want to make a lot of money. It's because they want to make enough money that is commensurate with their education and what they're doing. And um, and if they're demoralized over that, it's a terrible thing. Right. But what tends to keep them apart? And that's a, that's a very important question. So a couple of things that I've observed is this. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. You know, physicians are scientists and they are academics. And they have relationships with their colleagues outside of the examining room outside of the uh, operating suite. And what are those relationships? Those relationships are sharing scientific knowledge, writing articles for journals, teaching residents and interns. And so there's a lot of relationships outside the actual practice 
with colleagues who are at a higher level in the um, you know, responsibility chain of healthcare. Might be their department head, might be their chief, might even be the chief medical officer who they're very close with when it comes to their professional uh, and intellectual and academic work. And so one of the things that I've observed and, and heard directly from doctors is, do I really want to jeopardize those relationships by unionizing? And I guess the answer always comes down to the fact that you can do two things at once, which is that you can maintain those relationships and uh, build a kind of mutual respect over the need to unionize in the context of that broader set of relationships. So, uh, but, it, but I think that that's a factor that doctors think about a lot that, you know, tends them tends to make them a bit more hesitant from time to time about organizing a union. And then, of course, you know, there is the issue, the, there is the S word, the strike word. Um, and, you know, talk about, you know, uh, not wanting to do harm. You know, a strike by definition can do harm. You know, it, it could close down a hospital. It could delay services uh, and so yeah. on. But I think it's important to confront that head on and say that there's doctors all over the world who belong to unions. Um, you know, this is not just an American issue. There's doctors in Germany and France and Austria and England and all over the Japan, all over the world in industrial countries, not that different than ours, where all the doctors belong to a union. We're the only country where they don't, frankly. And there are strikes in those countries, not because they want to, but because uh, it's part of a, a potential breakdown of what I would call social solidarity. In a lot of countries, you have social solidarity, where there's a generalized belief in the common good, and from time to time, there needs to be a reckoning with that. Here in the United States, it's different. We don't really have that kind of culture, but strikes are extremely rare, and uh, I, I really do believe that doctors have the power, short of a strike, to influence uh, improvement in working conditions. And that's frankly why you see so few strikes among doctors, because doctors have been unionized for a long time in the public sector in the United States. New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, Florida, uh, Houston, uh, and so on. Many doctors belong to unions in the public sector, and it's very rare that you see a strike. So uh, it's not that it's something that ought to be taken lightly, but it has not uh, been a, a big part of the history here among doctors uh, who have been unionized. I think that's because of their inherent power and importance in the system. And uh, it's better to work, work things out, even if it's going to cause some uh, uh, additional cost to the employer. So you're saying there's a lot that can happen before a strike would actually have to be put into effect. And so simply by having a rallying of well, I, I can always, I'm, together. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you because I was going to jump on the same thing that I picked up from what John said. If you don't mind, I want to interrupt John. Just uh, putting you on the hot seat, just off the cuff. I'm, I'm sure there's doctors out there who are going to listen to this and say, OK, I could think of some things we could do sh uh, short of striking as well. But I'd like to hear what John has to say. So what, what are a few things that they can do short of striking? <clears throat> well, I, what they do do. Uh, uh, among doctors who are unionized is that they spend a lot of time educating their community about why they are doing what they're doing in terms of engaging in collective bargaining and organizing a union. Uh, they involve uh, important members of the community, uh, including political leadership from both sides of the aisle. They involve community organizations and the clergy and uh uh, many, many advocacy groups for patients, whether it's in behavioral health, pediatrics. I mean, every, you know, every single uh, area of medicine has advocacy groups who stand up for services in an area to make sure that people get the services they need. So there's a broad network of people who pay attention to healthcare, whether they're in, in the public policy realm, meaning 
legislators and uh, administrators, as well as community organizations, as well as religious organizations who, as you know, play a big role and historically have played a big role in healthcare in the United States. So uh, building that kind of relationship with the community, I don't just say going out and asking for help from the community when they need it. It's building that relationship over time. That is the most effective way of gaining quote unquote leverage in, in winning uh, a union contract and improving conditions. And that's what that's what they do. And that's why they're successful. So that goes way beyond just the doctors themselves within that employer setting. It's totally tied into like almost a sub community within the community at large that's participating and collectively working. So it's almost like what you're saying is the doctors are not on their own. There's a, a swell of support that surrounds them because at the end of the day, what matters here is patient care. It's patient outcomes. And we've seen nothing but the quality of patient outcomes get worse and worse and worse. And a ton of that has to do with the time per patient. And there's a whole upstream aspect to what's going on above before the doctor even gets to see the patient that's interrupting what they actually get to do with that patient. So I think that sounds something that as, as an encouraging aspect to this, that as a leader, as somebody who cares about your profession, simply by getting and gathering up some of your colleagues together, there's a community support system that will come in and help you. And frankly, that's what we're here. For. What's what, why we exist. We're here to support you as the individual in the workplace to have that voice. John, you, so, you, keep, you, you were talking about <clears throat> unions all over the country. That that's that's news to me. Um, can you talk a little bit more? You said San Francisco, you said California, uh, you, well, you said, where else did you say Chicago? Uh, right. you, you rattled off a few. Right. See, in the, in the public sector, which by the way, we should also remember, there was once a time in the United States when public health was the health system. So you, you, you look at a place like New York City, Los Angeles, any big city in the United States, and it used to be even in small towns, that healthcare was delivered through public services. And um, it, it's, it's, it's not universal by any stretch, but there are many tens of thousands of doctors who have belonged to unions for many decades in uh, the public sector. What does that look like for, for the resident who just finished their training Yeah, last month? Describe this a little bit more fully to help them understand what they would be experiencing and how that would be different back when that was compared to the now, if you could. Well, um, what's changed is, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that we don't talk about in the United States is how it used to be that, you know, 75 years ago, 60 years ago, uh, most health care in the United States was delivered through major public institutions, hospitals, clinics. Um, and then you had a lot of doctors who were in private practice. Right. You all you had you did have private hospitals, but for the average person who didn't have a lot of money, um, and even for people who were middle class, the public institutions were the best institutions in, in the United States. San Francisco General Hospital, um, UCLA Medical Center, um, uh, Denver Health, uh, New York City Public Hospitals, and so on and so forth. Cook County in Chicago. What's happened is that there's been this tremendous defunding of public health over the last 50 years. And today, only about 3% of all the money we spend on healthcare goes to the public sector. So the big difference, Justin, is that today, when you come out of medical school, you not only are you going to be working in uh, corporate medicine, but you're going to be working in private medicine more and more, where uh, decision-making is uh, uh, 
much more detached from the community than it was when we had a public health system in the United States. It's been this huge shift. So I remember, I remember my grandmother in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Every month, she would take a trip to what she called county hospital. Well, guess what? There is no such thing as a county hospital in Milwaukee anymore. It doesn't exist. And that's where everyone went, whether it was for uh, a routine checkup like she would go for or for, you know, complicated surgery. They were the best hospitals in the country. They don't exist anymore except, you know, in fewer and fewer places. And doctors were way, were, were way more plugged in in the decision making in that setting. Definitely. And they, they also formed unions. And, and the unions were formed not so much out of grievance. They were formed as being part of a kind of social commitment, if you will. Just like, you know, that's the whole notion of public health. It's uh, yeah. kind of like having an HOA in a neighborhood. Yeah. Well, in a sense, in a sense, yeah, that there's a sense of a social a leadership group, a decision making group. If there's ever any any discrepancies or questions or people aren't the, the physicians uh, can't come to an agreement on something, there's a group, there's a leadership group. Yeah. So yeah. as opposed to. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No. So as opposed to out of grievance, it's it's hey. This is just what we do. We form a group, a leadership group. We can That's right. you know, we we all spend two years doing it, and then the next person comes in. And this exactly. is exactly it was, it was not so much that people had grievances with one another, which is often a way people think about unions, that it was more part of the, the social uh, network of what yeah. you know our communities you know once were. And I think we would all agree that our communities could use a lot more social network than we have today, where it feels like everybody's just on their own, you know. Yeah. Well, it's 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 wild to me to hear you say <clears throat> unions were formed not out of grievance. They were formed out of a, 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 a group needing a board of directors. Right. In my lifetime, the only the only reason you have or you participate in a union is because you are being uh, treated unjustly. You know, mm -hmm. what was it? not not but a year ago. Um, the labor union for uh, uh, automo the automobile uh, industry. Oh, that that was like six months ago. They struck, they struck and got what they wanted. And so I, I just have never heard needing to form a union for any other reason than to fight. You're taking us. Well, and that goes back to what John said about good versus evil. I think the whole notion of union now has gotten maybe such a branding sort of a, a negative connotation associated with it rather than it being a community support mechanism. It's now, well, doctors, they shouldn't have grievances. Like they're the last person that should be having a grievance about anything. So everybody else on the outside would say, you know, looking in from that perspective, but what is the pathway forward here, John? Do you think we're, we're talking about this as it's been done before? There's pieces of it being done here and there. The time is now more than ever because of what, two weeks ago, another Medicare cut announcement every single year. It just continues to happen. What do you see as that pathway and how people who are afraid of unions or are afraid of organizing or maybe like the, the team health doctor that I spoke to yesterday who has been part admin role part clinician role, they see both sides, but then there's more work that gets put on his plate because he's trying to be the intermediary. And so he's in a tough spot because he's trying to satisfy admin, but also satisfy doctors. And so he's, he's in a, a tough place. What, how can people begin to start to identify that these types of steps are in the patient's best interests and in their best interests? Right. Well, to be honest with you, I'll, I'll just build on what you said, um, which is that um, you're right. You know, un unfortunately uh, and incorrectly, uh, a lot of the public has this interpretation of labor union as some sort of good and evil. And um, the the fact is, is that um, 
unions were founded on grievance. I'm not, and that's probably true even in healthcare. I'm, I was talking specifically about the public sector. But it's also the case that I think we can evolve way far away from grievance being the only motivating factor and that it, it, we evolve towards problem solving on behalf of the community and the patients. And I, I firmly believe that the more the doctors organize, they are going to move in that direction. Because from my, my experience with doctors, and quite frankly, with lots of other working people, is that grievance is only, I would say it's a minority of the motivation. The main motivation is to have a voice. And the voice is not just about wages and working conditions. It's about my contribution and my purpose. I think that's true for everyone. And so I think that uh, doctors can really lead that type of uh, union thinking and union organization. And I think that's going to be the key to success. <clears throat> to maybe start with grievance, but move towards a broader social interpretation of why we need to unionize. And I think it's going to happen. So for the doctor then, listening to this, what would be action items, action steps that they should take <laughs> to do something about this, to not just hear the conversation, but to actually put something into practice, into motion? What are some tangible steps they can take, as you've seen within the labor movement over generations? What would you say is your call to action that you suggest that they consider? I think I think the call to action is that um, there are more and more organizations like Doc Nation, uh, some of the professional associations, and then of course there's the labor movement itself. And I think that it's important that doctors come together either in their in their lounge or uh, after work, uh, having a bite to eat, and saying we're we're going to make a commitment to reach out to an organization to help us think through how we can regain our voice. And, you know, um, I happen to believe it is going to require unionization uh, because there's a long tradition in this country, and I can't think of any other, you know, not that different than the civil rights movement or other major movements in this country where people have had to organize themselves for a purpose. And when it comes to gaining voice, uh, the most effective way is through a union. So I think that um, it's incumbent upon people to think that through, reach out to whether it's Doc Nation, whether it's their professional organization, uh, even the AMA, or look up one of the major healthcare unions in the country, SEIU, AFT, uh, as examples, and make the call and get started. All right. I think that's a good place to land the plane. This might be a one, this might be a, a 10 part series and this might be part one. If we could get John, John, that's a lot for John, I think, but uh, uh, there's just so much that, that so much knowledge that you have. And we have a whole uh, slideshow that and I think we covered a fraction of it because um, I think there's some high level points that I wanted to, we wanted to make on our first uh, podcast here. Um, but for, uh, our Doc Nation following. This is our first podcast. We've switched from um, webinars, our night, our, our once a month webinars at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time to uh, podcasts, uh, so people could uh, listen to these whenever they wanted. So that's just a, a Doc Nation update here. But um, Justin, unless you don't have anything else, I just want to say thank you, John, and I appreciate your time. And and we'll be seeing more of you, and so will our so will our following. Yes, thank you, John. John, any, la any last words? No, just uh, best to all of you, and thanks for all the good work you do. Thank you, John. Have a great day. Take care. All righty. Bye-bye. 
This has been the Doc Nation Podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to us. Your feedback really helps us reach more listeners like you. We'd also love to hear your thoughts and any topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn for updates, behind-the-scenes content, and to join the conversation. Thanks for listening.